We continue our examination into child poverty and welfare reforms, this week from a legal perspective. Will the government's welfare reforms cause undue hardship on children whose parents do not comply with new orders? Social Development Minister Paula Bennett has threatened to slash the benefit from parents who fail to enrol children into early childhood education. Could this lead to the government being taken to court? We put these questions to Katrina McLennan, one of New Zealand's most experienced lawyers representing women who have been discriminated against by officialdom. Uh, Katrina McLennan, uh, welcome to the programme. Kia ora, hello. Uh, what are some of the main criteria that is used to test whether or not a mother is entitled to DPB entitlement? Well, that's dealt with under the Social Security Act and the test is whether the person is in a relationship in the nature of marriage or living separately just with children. And if a woman is in the relationship in the nature of marriage, she's not entitled to the domestic purposes benefit. But probably as anyone can tell just from that phrase, relationship in the nature of marriage, it's not the easiest mm. test and not the easiest legal test. And so there have been a number of cases that have been dealt with in the courts in New Zealand. And at one point there was a checklist of mm. about 10 issues and that was things like whether the couple had children together, whether they went on holidays together, whether other people viewed them as a couple. And then in 1996, the Court of Appeal made a decision in a case called Rooker and Department of Social Welfare, and that involved a woman who'd been in an extremely violent relationship. And the lawyer there argued that the relationship was so violent and there was so little financial and emotional support that mm. it couldn't actually be characterised as a relationship Mm. and the Court of Appeal accepted that and so that meant afterwards that work and income had to go back, change its policies, apply a different legal test. And what would be that legal test now? Well it's still not easily able to be summed up in one point but that Rooker case is still very relevant for women in violent relationships mm. and what often happens there is that the man is coming and going, the woman and children try to get away, they mm. get hunted down and dragged back again. So the, the woman, the mother is in a, in a vulnerable position mm. or, or in a very weak position yeah. to actually Re, uh, regress away from a relationship. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so her, her circumstances might be changing a lot too, so it's quite difficult mm. to determine. Mm. Um, what my concern has been as a lawyer, though, is that work and income hasn't always applied the law correctly and in 2001 there was the Joy Child report which investigated how the law had been implemented since the Rooker decision. And this was led by Frances Joy Child right. who was the law commissioner at the time. That's right, yeah. yes. And she found that actually work and income had failed to implement that decision and so a large number of women had not received benefits to which they were entitled or they'd actually been paid the money and then work and income investigators had decided they weren't entitled to the benefit and so assessed death, mm. debts against them and you know they might have ended up with tens of thousands mm. of dollars worth of debts and I can think of one client um, who'd been in a very violent relationship and she had head injuries and work and income assessed a debt of about 50000 against her and said she had to repay it and she'd actually been absolutely entitled to that money all along but I mean you can imagine how stressful it is for women in really difficult mm. situations trying to get away from the violent partner trying to do a good job all on their own as mothers and then having these horrendous debts against them having mm. the department sort of pursuing them when actually the department's supposed to be there to provide financial support to people in need. Well let's look at that department role mm. um, at this stage and we'll ex explore a little bit more of perhaps third party malicious kind of complaint mm. Um, in the middle of the interview, mm -hmm. um, with, with, with the government, when a government, when a government mm -hmm. takes a um, fairly aggressive stance or takes one where it starts to apply mm, a, an aggressive policy mm -hmm. toward beneficiaries, where there's a grey area relating to inclusive entitlement, um, does that cause case managers perhaps to go on the side of the government culture that, and, and exclude people from even mm. perhaps 
finding the legal entitlement, mm. let alone assuming it. Yeah, I think it's been pretty well established that what that's what happens in New Zealand. And Do I you see ups and downs of that? Well, I don't actually think it's just a government problem. I mean, mm. I think as a nation we have quite a punitive, negative approach to beneficiaries. And particularly for some reason that I cannot understand at all to women um, on the DPB. And, you know, we know that we've got a huge child support debt, mm. a large part of which is owed by fathers. Why don't they get the public condemnation? Mm. And also, um, you know, rich people who don't pay tax, there's been some recent figures released that show that half of the wealthiest people in New Zealand don't pay tax. Well, why yes. don't we, why aren't we pursuing so them? There are two ironies. Yeah. Um, where there's a child, inevitably somewhere in the mix, there's a, there's a male. Mm. And there seems to be a lack of political will to yeah. actually seek an equitable kind of mm. return back if yeah. you're looking for money to balance yeah. off the DPB from the men in these yeah. situations. And I think that's partly driven because you know, as I was just mentioning, I think that society, we seem to have this down on women who are on benefits bringing up children. So yeah. you think the men get an easy ride and I get do. away with mm. these types of things. Yeah. And, and how can that be remedied? Well, um, hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's quite a big question. Um, I mean, I guess that needs a change of attitude at community level and at government level. But one of the cases I was involved in, and an issue that's puzzled me, when um, women who are on the DPB, if there's an investigation and work and income decides they weren't entitled to the benefit and they have to pay it back and sometimes they're prosecuted, there's never any attempt made ever to recoup any of the money from the men. Mm. But I mean, obviously, if there has been a relationship, um, the men have actually enjoyed the benefit of the money and mm. why are they not pursued? And actually, in a recent case I was involved in, the High Court judge actually asked that question, but I've never ever heard of that being done. So this this case you're referring to, um, that was exposing the vulnerabilities that mothers who are on the DPV mm. um, face where perhaps malicious intent that's being used by an ex-partner mm. to complain against them ends up being you know, all of their problem. Is mm -hmm. that correct? And, and, and what, what kind of ben it, it has the court determined whether or not the male in the equation, the, the partner mm -hmm. perhaps, um, has benefited as well during a period perhaps? Where it's, yeah. No, there's, there's never been any decision in New Zealand that's, help, that's even looked at what benefit the man's received and mm. the men are never asked to repay. And I think we've got a big problem um, people who want to make complaints um, alleging that beneficiaries are getting benefits to which they aren't entitled, they can make a complaint to work and income mm -hmm. and work and income will follow up on that. But um, the beneficiary or their lawyer is not entitled to know who's made the complaint. Mm -hmm. And I just know from cases I've been involved in that quite often complaints are made by ex-partners. Well, I mean, for a start, you would take that with a grain of salt, you'd think. and Or test it more clearly. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah, because obviously they've probably got a vested interest and perhaps a malicious purpose. And I remember my first case at the Social Security Appeal Authority, and we knew that it was the ex-partner who'd made the complaint. And that was the first question I asked was who had made the complaint. Oh, no, no. No, you can't ask that, you're not allowed to know that. Well, I think it's actually extremely relevant because these complaints are just so stressful and upsetting and worrying for beneficiaries. That case at the Social Security Appeal Authority, um, that woman had a debt of 45000 established against her. And I mean, in law, it wasn't a case that was unclear. I knew from day one that she had always been entitled to the benefit, but she had English as a second language. Mm. and. What work and income does is they just turn up at the beneficiary's house unannounced and say they want to interview them. And they asked this woman, um, do you live with the ex-partner? And she said yes, because English was her second language and she didn't distinguish between live and stay with. And she stayed mm. the odd night with him, but she definitely didn't live with him. And we had to go all the way to the Social Security Appeal Authority to sort that out. That woman for two years was absolutely convinced she was going to go to jail. You know, it's mm. just terrible. And what impact does that have on one, the, the mother, mm. the family unit, yeah. and also the child in that kind yeah. of insecurity? having a stressed mother. So yeah. from your observations, what impact does occur? Well, I mean, I think as anyone would acknowledge, it's really hard being a parent and even harder being a single mm. parent. And beneficiaries are 
basically the poorest people in our society. So as well as all the normal difficulties a parent's got, they're under extreme financial pressure. So they just really don't need this extra pressure, which is just quite unwarranted. So it seems that irrespective of what government's in power, the actual barriers to actually accessing a DPB and certainly sustaining it mm. a multiple, mm. you know, a very difficult situation. If, mm. we, if we look at perhaps at the moment, um, the, uh, the, 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 um, the government has moved on establishing punitive exclusion mm. criteria that detail, for example, many of the viewers would already know this, but enrolling a child, the, the beneficiary, the mother must enroll a child aged three to five mm. in early childhood education mm. into a PHO or a GP type of environment, mm. general practitioner. Now, New Zealand as a government and New Zealand as a society has signed the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, mm -hmm. um, which state where, and I'll just quote here, um, the child has, um, the, there's the right of every child to a standard of living adequate for the child's physical, mental, spiritual, moral and social development. Mm -hmm. Now, when you consider the exclusion criteria that if a mother or a parent does not have the child mm. put into um, early childhood education, for example, and the, then the benefit can be cut in half or even stopped. Mm. What impact does that have on the child? I know it's ridiculous. I mean, if it wasn't so serious and concerning for the beneficiaries, I mean, you'd just find it difficult to take some of these policies seriously. So They're the, just ridiculous. So they would be. A reasonably minded New Zealander would, uh, would assume that there would be an impact on the child. Of course. If that's yeah. the case, mm. um, considering we're a signatory to the UN Convention here, mm. What recourse does a person have, perhaps, to try and write that imbalance? If mm -hmm. there is an established impact that is negative on mm. the child, what can New Zealanders do about it? Well, one of the cases I've been involved in, and we argued um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and just a couple of months ago, there's been um, the Aotearoa Human Rights Lawyers Association set up. And what they're going to do is they're going to look for suitable cases that could be taken to the United Nations Human mm. Rights Committee if perhaps there isn't a remedy in the New Zealand courts. Mm. So I think it would be really, I've actually talked to someone involved in setting it up. I think it would be great if um, this issue about women in the DPB could be looked at to go there because there's actually a discretion under the law not to require repayment. Mm. And some of these women have debts over 100,000. They'll never What's, be able to pay No, them. and I mean, every dollar that working income is taking back from that beneficiary is a dollar less that she's got to spend on a raincoat for the children, shoes for the children, food. You know, it's just keeping them in grinding poverty. And it means that she can never, ever better to the family's position because if she, for example, ever got a job and there was a bit more money coming into the family, working income would just put up the repayments. So it just means that the family could never, ever be better off. Mm. And do you see it as a community responsibility here that should be looking after? Yeah, of course. And I think in New Zealand, until probably the last 20 years, I think we actually did accept that. And somehow over the last, well, it's probably 25 years now, we've become a lot more selfish and individualistic and I think very judgmental. And we're not a high wage society. And I think people who are on reasonable incomes forget how close they can be to disaster. And I can think of a family who um, the husband and wife worked together as contractors, really responsible, had insurance, and there was a fire in the premises they worked in, instant financial disaster, you know. Mm. Yeah. Well, Katrina McLennan, thank you very much. That was Katrina McLennan. And that's all for now. We're back at the same time next week with more guests on the Beats and Interview. Until then, thanks for your company and see you soon. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.